I'll tell you guys a story. When I was a kid, I did not like my height. Being honest with you, I'm fine with it now on some days. <laughs> I've just come to accept the fact that I'm a, a normal height and there's other people who are abnormally tall. <laughs> like Brother Marcus or Mr. Kevin. Anybody over six foot in my books about abnormally tall. That tall-itis. When I was a kid, I, I, didn't, I didn't like it that much. Well, one day I decided to, to come up with a plan. I was going to fix the problem. I was going to ensure that I got taller. My mom, uh, just about every summer, she'd always have tomatoes. She'd always grow tomatoes. Even if we were not having a garden that year, she'd have tomato plants in a pot. And she was a believer in miracle grow. She loved miracle grow <laughs> on her tomato plants. And so I got it in my head one day, if, if miracle grow would make tomato plants grow, what would it do for me? So I got one of her, her tea pitchers out, and I mixed it up. And if you remember, miracle grow is bright blue. It looks like Kool-Aid. It looks like a berry Kool-Aid. Well, I, I mixed it up one summer day, and I fixed me a glass to, to go with my lunch. And it did not taste like Kool-Aid. <laughs> it tasted like... Um, Cat guts and worm hearts, whatever that tastes like. And so I started, I started drinking it, you know, I was like, well, it, it's worth it. If I can get a few inches, it, it'd be worth it in the long run. So I started drinking that. My dad came home. He was a school principal. It's during the summertime. He got to come home at lunch. And uh, he said, son, fix me a glass of that Kool-Aid. I didn't say anything. I fixed him a glass to go with his. He took a sip of it, and he said, son, you put any sugar in that? I said, do you put sugar in miracle Grove?" And he said, you're drinking miracle Grow." <laughs> it didn't kill me, but as you can see, it didn't do anything about my height either. You can't control how tall you are. If you could, I would be taller. Maybe some of you would be shorter. But there's one area of growth that you can control. There's one area of growth that you do have a say in. And that's growing in the Lord Jesus. As you think about growth, there's two sides to it. Your growth, your maturity in the Lord, part of it is God's responsibility. He produces a miracle in your life for you to grow. And He's always faithful in terms of His responsibility. But there's another side to it as well. There's a responsibility that we have. If you're going to grow, you're going to have to be diligent. You're going to have to commit yourself to doing the things that bring about growth, that bring about the bearing of fruit in your Christian life. This morning, I want to talk with you about that. I want to share with you three musts, three musts that, that must be present in your life if you are to grow. And I want to remind you of this fact. You are not to be static in your relationship with Jesus. How many of you remember Finding Nemo? Finding Dory? What was the little ditty that she sang? Must keep swimming, must keep swimming. The parents know it. A Christian's mantra should be, must keep growing, must keep growing. You are not to be static in your relationship with Jesus. You are to grow and you are to bear fruit. And I want to share with you this morning three musts for growing and for bearing fruit for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I want to do this for, for two different reasons. Number one is this. I want to speak to the lost. Every life is going to produce fruit. Did you know that? Fruit, by the way, is the character of your life. The actions, the deeds, the words. Every life is going to produce fruit. But if you're lost, if you're not in Christ, the fruit that you are going to produce is nasty, toxic, vile. It does not please God. It harms yourself and it harms your family. I want you that are lost today to recognize that and come to the Lord. Let Him give you a new heart. Let Him save you so that you can produce the fruit that pleases God. I also want to preach this message this morning to believers. Have you been diligent in growing and bearing fruit? Remember we said that there's two parts to this. God has a responsibility. He's always faithful in His part. But are you being faithful in your responsibility? in your part of growth. If you've been negligent 
If you've been thinking more about the world than the things of eternity, than your relationship with Jesus, then it's my hope that the Spirit of God will convict you and you will come in repentance, return to the Lord, and make a renewed commitment to grow, to mature in the Lord Jesus, and to bear fruit. Before we go any further, I want to invite you to join me in prayer. Let's ask God's blessing on this message. Our Heavenly Father, we take a moment to pause and enter the sanctity of your presence. You are the one true God. Besides you, there is no other, and Jesus is your only begotten Son. We thank you for our salvation through Jesus. You saved us in Christ, not through our deeds of, of righteousness, not because we are worthy or have any merit in and of ourselves. Salvation through Christ is an act of grace. It is you deciding to have mercy on us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy received through the Lord Jesus. But Lord, when you save us, we're not to be a bench warmer. We're not to remain as we were. We are to grow. In a sense, we are to be your PR agents. We are to advertise who you are and what you are like. Father, we do that through the character, the virtues, the fruit of our lives. Lord, I pray that the fruit that we produce would reveal to a lost and dying world who you are. That the fruit we produce, the fruit of life, would please you and show to the world the authenticity of our salvation, of our relationship with Jesus. Father, I pray this morning as I proclaim your word, that you would anoint me with the blessed Holy Spirit. Father, I can't preach on my own. I'm not strong enough. I'm not talented enough. don't have enough smarts or wisdom on my own. I need you. I humble myself before you and I claim the promise of your word from 1 Peter 5 and, and James 4. It says if we humble ourselves in your presence, you'll raise us up. You will exalt us in due season. I humble myself, Lord, so that I could preach your word with power, authority, and unction from on high. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters who have gathered here this morning. I love them. I care about them. And Lord, I want them to hear your word, to receive it. What they hear, let them understand. What they understand, let them believe. And what they believe, let them put into practice in life. Lord, if there's someone here and they recognize today that the fruit they produce is nasty, vile, sinful. Lord, I pray that they would recognize their need for a Savior. They'd recognize that they need a new tree. They need a new heart. And in doing so, they would turn to Jesus. Lord, if there are believers here today that recognize they're not doing their part in growth and producing fruit, then Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit would convict them. They would return to you in contrition and with a renewed dedication to living for you and bearing fruit. Use this message for your glory and for the strengthening of this church and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to try and make this sermon as simple as I can. i got three very simple points. Three musts if you're going to grow in the Lord Jesus, if you're going to produce the fruit that pleases God, three musts. The first must that I want you to see. If you're going to bear fruit... If you're going to grow, uh, you must be converted. You must be converted. I think that's the wrong outline, brother. Don't worry about it. We're good. The, the outline is so simple that you can just remember it. You must be converted. You must be committed. And you must pay the cost. Did you got that? You must be converted. You must be committed, and you must pay the cost. I didn't like my original outline, and so I went back and changed it this week, and I think I gave them the wrong one to put on the screen. It's all on me, but you'll remember this outline. Let's talk about the first must. You must be converted. I want to call your attention to verse 5 of our passage of Scripture. Verse 5 of our passage of Scripture. And I want you to look at the very first phrase. This is a phrase that when we find it in our daily Bible reading or in a scripture reading, we tend to just kind of blow through it. We think it's probably not that important. We want to get to the meat of the verse. Well, it is. Listen to what it says. Now for this very reason also. 
Are you like me? Sometimes you want to skip that part. You say, well, that's not... Ah, that's just superficial stuff. Let's just get to the meat. It is important. The Apostle Peter is doing something very significant here. What does he mean when he says, now for this very reason also? He is saying, what I'm about to tell you, I'm reaching a conclusion on the basis of what I just said. I think the King James says, and beside this. I'm reaching a conclusion The argument, the statement that I am about to make is based on what I just said, the previous statement. Have y'all got that? You following me? Well, what's the previous thing? What's he alluding to? What's he talking about? He's saying in verse 5 that we need to grow, that we need to be diligent in bearing fruit for the Lord Jesus. Well, how do you do that? What's the basis for it? Well, go back and look at verse 4. In verses uh, 3 and 4, he talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 1 that we've received a faith like the apostles, and that faith has been given to us through Jesus. He says that Jesus has divine power. On the basis of that divine power, he's granted to us magnificent and precious promises. And on the basis of these promises, he makes a very important statement. He says, you may become partakers of of the divine nature. That's what it says in verse 4. You may become partakers of the divine nature. That is a unique phrase in the New Testament. That is the only time that that phrase is used. Now the wording may be unique, but the sentiment is not. The idea of a partaker of the divine nature means to be born again, to be converted, to be saved. The idea of being born again, of being converted, is all throughout the Bible, especially in the New Testament. What is Peter getting at right here? He's saying that a prerequisite to growing in the Lord, to bearing fruit for the Lord Jesus, is conversion. It is salvation. If you are not saved, then you cannot bear fruit that pleases the Lord Jesus. Now, let's walk through the ramifications of that. Remember what I said in our little introduction? Every life bears fruit. Every every life does. The question is not if you bear fruit, but what kind of fruit are you bearing? If you are lost, the fruit that you bear is toxic. It's nasty because what you're going to do, the way that you live, your words, your Deeds, the actions of your life, it all starts in here with the inner person, with the heart of the man or the woman. Now, in a lost condition, we are told that your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. It is full of sin. That means on that basis, when when you're lost and your heart is wicked, the deeds of your life, the fruit that you produce, is not going to please God. It's going to be nasty. It's going to be vile. What kind of fruit does a lost person produce? They produce blasphemy, drunkenness, substance abuse, rage, violence. We could name many more. That is the fruit that they produce on the basis of their spiritual condition. What Peter is saying here, if you're going to grow in the Lord and if you're going to produce the right kind of fruit, you must be a partaker of the divine nature. You must be given a new heart. You must be given a new spiritual tree, so to speak. And then, and only then, can you bear the fruit that pleases God. That fruit of moral excellence, that fruit of knowledge, that fruit of self-control, that fruit of perseverance, of godliness, of brotherly kindness and love. You must be born again. You must be converted to bear fruit that pleases God. Now, I'm hammering this for a reason. It's because there is a misconception about this, especially in our culture. We have this idea that if we just make a number of personal resolutions, if we just make a commitment to reform ourselves, to somehow clean ourselves up, then we can change the fruit that we bear. No, you can't. Let me give you an example. Let's say that I wanted apples. I wanted to grow apples. I wanted apple butter. 
I wanted apple pies, this, that, and the other. I wanted apples, and so I, I decided I was going to plant some trees. But instead of planting an apple tree, I planted pear trees. Now, I may be very diligent with those trees. I may cultivate them, take care of them, spray them. When the limbs get heavy with fruit, tie them up. I may keep the squirrels off of them. I may do everything in my power to make sure that that tree produces fruit. But will it ever produce apples? No, it's always going to produce pears. It's the same thing in your spiritual life. If you are lost, if you are without Christ, no matter what you do to your tree, no matter what you do to your heart, it's still going to produce nasty stuff. You must have a heart transplant. You need that tree of your old life uprooted and removed. And you need a tree of righteousness planted in your life. What kind of fruit are you producing? Depends on what kind of tree you have. What's your heart like today? If you are not converted, the fruit you produce is nasty. And you'll never be able to change that. What you can do, what you must do is come to Jesus. Jesus has divine power. He is willing to give us salvation. He is willing to enable us to be a partaker of the divine nature. And when that happens, your fruit will change. Have you got the cart before the horse? Are you trying to produce good things with a wicked heart? Won't happen. You must be converted. You must have Jesus. Now let's move on. Let's look at a second must. Uh, you saw, first of all, that you must be converted. Now second, I want you to see, you must be committed. You must be committed. Now I want to call your attention to verse 5 again. And I want us to look at the second part. After telling us that he's going to make a conclusion based on previous material after saying now for this very reason also the next phrase, the next clause is applying all diligence. That's the New American Standard. The King James is almost identical. It says giving all diligence. That word diligence right there, this is Peter's favorite word in 2 Peter. In three chapters, he uses it three times. He uses it right there in verse 5. He says, applying all diligence. If you look on further down in chapter 1, verse 10, uses the very same word. He says, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. He says, you need to be diligent in making sure of your salvation. He uses the, the word diligent again in chapter 3, verse 14. He says, therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, talking about the coming of Jesus, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. This is his favorite word. Repeats it three times. Why does he do that? Why the reason for the repetition? Well, let me ask you that question. Why do you repeat yourself? Why do you repeat yourself? You're looking sheepishly like you don't do it. Of course you repeat yourself. Every person repeats themselves. Why do you repeat yourself? Huh? Make it plain? Yeah, make it plain. What else? To ensure memory. To ensure memory. You want them to remember it. What else? There's one that you, ha you haven't gotten yet. Both of those are right. Because you want them to obey it. Don't you want it obeyed? You want it to be plain? You want them to remember it, and you want it obeyed. That's why Peter repeats this three times. Be diligent. Remember the background? He's about to die. He's going to be leaving them, and he wants to make sure that they remember what he says. He's got some important things. This is like his last will and testament. Now, what exactly is he telling them? When he says, be diligent, or as he says in verse 5, applying all diligence, what exactly is he talking about? Well, he's talking about a part of the Christian life. Now, I've got to unpack this a second, so let me do it. We can speak about salvation as having three parts. There is justification. There is sanctification. There is glorification. Think of it as past present and future 
Justification is when you come to Jesus. You repent of your sins. You make a life commitment to Him. You put your faith in Him. At that moment, you are justified. Justification, or justified, is a legal word. It means to be put in a right legal standing before God. That happens instantly. And it's a past thing. When, you're done, when you've done it, it's done. It is complete. Sanctification is the present part of our salvation. In a sense, you have been saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. Sanctification is when you become more like Jesus. You're being set apart. You're being made holy each day as you listen to the Word of God, as you obey Jesus, as you do those things that please Him and refrain from doing those things that displease Him. You grow in godliness. You're being saved. And then glorification is uh, you will be saved. There will come a time, according to 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 3, there's going to come a time when you see Jesus as He is, in His glory, in His splendor, and in His majesty. And in verse 2, it says, when we see Jesus as He is, we will be made like Him. Our salvation will be consummated. All the promises of God will become a reality. Peter is speaking about sanctification. He's speaking about the present time. If you are in Christ, you are in the process of sanctification. On a daily basis, you are becoming more and more like Jesus. And what Peter is saying right there is, as you follow the Lord, you must be diligent. Remember what we said earlier? That our growth in the Lord is like two sides of a coin. God has a responsibility. We know that from Philippians 1 verse 6. Uh, when you receive the Lord Jesus, you become His responsibility and He's going to bring you to maturity until the day of Jesus. But the other side of that coin is our responsibility. We have a part to play in our growth. And Peter says, as I'm a dying man, I want you to be diligent. Even after I'm gone, I want to see you grow. I want to see you bear fruit for the Lord Jesus. Notice what he says specifically in verse 5. He says, apply all diligence. He doesn't say apply part-time diligence. He doesn't say apply 50% worth of diligence and you'll be fine. He's not even saying apply 100% diligence. He's saying apply 150% diligence. Give it everything you have to grow for the Lord Jesus Christ. That requires a commitment. If you're going to grow, if you're going to bear fruit, you must be committed. And unfortunately today, we live in a time and an era where Christians lack that kind of commitment. Your relationship with Jesus is that deep because you won't commit. You won't make your relationship with the Lord the priority of your life. You won't apply all diligence. You think you can get by with 10% diligence. You think that you can get by with part-time obedience to the Lord. It doesn't work that way. Bearing fruit for the Lord Jesus is the best thing you can do because the fruit that you bear for Him will stand the test of eternity. It'll last. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that you should store up treasures from yourself in heaven where nobody can steal it. It won't decay or become corrupt. What you bear for Him on this earth will stand the test of eternity. That's a good investment. But it requires commitment. Now y'all know that I'm not a sports fan. I just, I don't do sports. But I was thinking about the highlights from the 2012 Olympics. I really didn't watch the Olympic Games. I just kind of Watched the highlights when they came on the news. And I thought about one of the stories I remember from back then. The 400-meter relay race. I think that was probably the most exciting part of the Olympics. Uh, the U.S. team had the highest qualifying time. Don't ask me what it was. I can't remember. But what was significant about that was the guy who ran the first leg of the race, I think his name was Mateo Mitchell, he was running and he broke his fibula as he was running. And he didn't stop. Not only did he run, but he ran fast. So fast that he completed his first leg and he led them to having the highest qualifying time. That's commitment, isn't it? 
running on a broke leg. I don't want to run with a skint toe. I don't want to run with my feet fine. But running on a broke leg. And why did they do it? Respect and a little piece of metal. At best, you get your name on a box of Wheaties, right? In the picture. But they apply diligence to stuff like that. What about your relationship with Jesus? What about bearing fruit for the Lord? What are you giving there? We give Him the crumbs. We give Him the leftovers when we've done everything else we wanted to. That's not right. You're never going to grow. You're never going to bear much fruit for the Lord. Peter says, apply all diligence. Now let's move on. Let's look at a third must for growing in the Lord, for bearing fruit. We've seen you must be converted. You must be committed. Now lastly, thirdly, you must pay the cost. You must pay the cost. Now, look at verse 5 of our passage again. We've looked at the first two phrases. Let's look at a third phrase now in verse 5. He says, Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith. What's the next word? Applying all diligence in your faith. Supply. Supply. In the King James Version, I believe it says add. Add. Now, when he says in your faith here, he's talking about your relationship with Jesus. You're to be diligent, apply all diligence in your relationship with Jesus. And he says, in that relationship, supply, add, supply. And then he gives a list of virtues, a list of fruits that we're to grow in. Moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. I want us to camp out on this word supply for a second. It's an important word. In the Greek, it is the word epikorig aesete. Epikorig aesete. I spent all week trying to memorize how to say that. Epikorig aesete. It's got a really storied background to it. I love studying the background of Greek words. It helps me understand the Bible more. I hope it helps you. Epikorig aesete, in order to understand the true meaning of that word, to inform how we read this scripture, we need to go back and we need to understand something about Greek culture. Uh, the Greek culture was made up of Greek city-states. And each city-state prided itself on something. It's theater. The Greeks loved theater. It's like our Hollywood today, our movies, our celebrity. And the theater in each Greek city-state was the pride, their pride and joy. It was a very important part of their public life. Greek theater is a little bit different from theater today. One of the features of Greek theater is something called a chorus. And when we think about chorus, we think about music, but their, their chorus was mainly for like narration and those types of things. But what they would do is they would nominate somebody in their community to be a chorus leader. And that person had the responsibility of hiring the chorus, ensuring that they had proper training and equipping them. It was a great, great honor, uh, something worthy of respect. But there was kind of a catch to it. The person that they nominated had to fund it out of his own pocket. And they were expected to spare no expense. They were expected not to cut corners. They were to be lavish in getting the best performers they could, in getting them the best training they could, and in getting them the best equipment that they could possibly get. They were to spare no expense. That's where that word came from, epicoric acete. It re originally referred to that chorus leader who in supplying for the, the chorus of the city spared no expense. And it became a proverbial statement, a byword. And it meant to supply or to meet a need, but not to do it cheaply. Not to do it cutting corners. It meant to do it over and above. It meant to be lavish. Now, insert that. Peter says, for this reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, in your relationship with Jesus, lavishly, abundantly supply moral excellence. And then that list of those virtues. What's he telling us here? If you want to grow in the Lord Jesus, 
if you want to bear fruit for him, you've got to be willing to pay the cost. You've got to be willing to be lavish in that relationship. You've got to be willing to make an investment in it. And as I told you in the second point, it's still true. We're not willing to do that today. We want a good return on our investments, don't we? If you buy something, you want it to last. If you invest money or something, you want a good return. You want a good profit. People will invest in the things of this world. We invest in our hobby 